Okay, we're live. So Mayor, whenever you're ready, we're ready. So I'd like to call this meeting to order. Auburn City Council general session. There is nothing to report out of closed session. And I will ask for a roll call, please. Council Member Spokely. Here. Berlant. Here. Dowden Calvillo. Present. Riddell Harris. Here. And Mayor Amara. Present. Thank you. And can we... Acknowledgement and announcement. And I do have a, a commendation. It's for Lyme Disease Awareness Month. I, I, um... Oh, yes, Melissa. So, as May is Lyme Disease Awareness Month. Whereas Lyme disease is an often misunderstood illness that can cause serious health problems if it is not caught early and properly treated. And whereas Lyme disease is a bacterial infection caused by the spirochete Borrelia, oh boy, Berg de Ferry, and is primarily transmitted by the bite of an infected tick. If I said that wrong, you feel free. Okay. <laughs> the disease was first identified in North America in 1970s in Lyme, Connecticut, for which it was named. And since that time, the disease has since been found in all 50 states of the United States. The reach of Lyme disease is global, having been reported in more than 60 countries on 60 continents and several islands. And whereas patients with Lyme disease are frequently misdiagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, multiple sclerosis, and various psychiatric illnesses, including depression. Misdiagnosis of these diseases often delays the correct diagnosis and treatment while the underlying infection progresses. And whereas Lyme disease affects people of all ages, but is most common in children and older adults and in people who spend time outdoors in wooded grassy areas, including park rangers and firefighters. And whereas in California, the Lyme disease bacterium is transmitted, transmitted by the Western black leg tick, Isodes pacificus. Ticks are active year round, especially when it is wet. Thus, this tick is most common in the coastal region and along the western slope of the Sierra Nevada range, but has been found in 56 of California's 58 counties. And whereas in some areas of California, Lyme disease infection rates of the nymph uh, ticks have been found to be as high as 42%. Thus, the infection rate in certain regions of California is among the highest in the entire United States. However, since some areas of the state have not been tested for tick infection, the true scope of the problem is not known. And whereas, although Lyme disease is the most common vector-borne infection in the United States, the ticks that spread Lyme disease can also spread other diseases at the same time. Among these co-infections are diseases such as baby babesiosis, anaplasmosis and erlichiosis, the presence of which of co-infections can complicate the treatment of Lyme disease. And now, therefore, I, Sandra Amara, Mayor of Auburn, on behalf of the City Council, do proclaim the month of May 2021 as Lyme Disease Awareness Month and urge awareness amongst our residents, issued the first day of May 2022. And Melissa, Thank you for accepting this on behalf of the, of, would you like to state your name and who you represent? 
I'm Melissa Moya, and I have a foundation, Lime Fight Foundation. We're located in Sacramento. This is our second year, um, and we are just working on awareness for um, Lyme disease. Thank you. Melissa. Thank you Thank so you. much. I appreciate it. Um, so, beware. Um, agenda approval. This is time set aside for council members and or public ask for removal. Removal, postponement, or a change to the listed sequence on an agenda item. The agenda will be approved by consensus of the council. Do I have um, anyone who wants a change or wants to make a motion? Madam Mayor, I'll move approval of the agenda as proposed. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That passes and we'll move to the consent calendar. Um, consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine in nature and will be approved by one blanket motion with a roll call vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless persons request specific items to be removed from the consent calendar for discussion and separate action. Any items removed will be considered after the motion to approve the consent calendar. And again, as always, I wanna emphasize that the city council um, looks at this before. Many items have come before the city council and we meet with staff to answer any questions. But with that being said, I would like our city manager to just go over briefly um, the items on the consent calendar, please. Uh, Mayor and Council, uh, just a couple of items tonight. Uh, uh, item number one are the City Council minutes from uh, January 24th and from our Valentine's evening meeting on uh, February 14th. Uh, item number two, this is the authorization to bid. Uh, there are two aspects uh, on the maintenance that's going to be done on Auburn Folsom Road. First is the paving aspect, which is currently out to bid. Uh, tonight, staff's asking for authorization for uh, the slurry seal treatment. So there's different treatments on different parts of the roadway. Uh, in this case, it's either a type two or type three slurry that will go down, but this will authorize the bid on that. Item number three is uh, authorization uh, and approval of a consultant services agreement with Ralph Anderson and Associates for a class and compensation study. Uh, that'll, that amount comes in at about $24,000. Item number four is authorization to request and accept a matching grant with Caltrans regarding our helicopter uh, parking area uh, project. Uh, that seems to be the project that just keeps on giving. And in this case, uh, we're going to go for the uh, matching grant on this, which would come out to about $46,000. Item number five is a really simple amendment to our uh, economic uh, data uh, analysis that's being done by Beacon Economics. Basically, we're changing a couple of dates. Uh, the project will start next week. Uh, uh, in May, and hopefully we'll get a lot of the data in uh, soon. So that is the consent calendar. Thank you very much. Is there anyone on city council that would like to pull an item? And is there anyone in the public that would like to pull an item? Do I have a motion? Madam Mayor, I'll move approval of the consent calendar as presented this evening. I'll second. All in oh, um, the roll call vote. Council Member Spokely. Yes. Berlant. Aye. Bowden Calvillo. Aye. Riddell Harris. Aye. And Mayor Amara. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, public comment. This is the time provided so the public may speak to the council on any item not on the agenda. Please make your comments as brief as possible. The council cannot act on the items not included on the agenda. However, the items will be automatically referred to staff. Council members also have an option to speak on any item not on this agenda at this time. Um, and I just wanna briefly say, I'll put it out to city council. We had a lot of excitement over the weekend. Um, I'm sure our city manager and his staff report will give you more detail, but um, we had Earth Day, which was a wonderful event 
over at the Overlook and um, what an opportunity to have that and, and recognize uh, how important our earth is. And it was put on primarily by the high school students. I was very proud of them. That was a wonderful, wonderful event. And of course we had the um, UTMB, the, the endurance race that started in Auburn. And that was a very prestigious race um, that was started in downtown Auburn. And uh, there was a pre-party the night before. It was a very festive opportunity. And it was um, a time where some businesses, um, you know, there was closure. And so some businesses were probably affected, hopefully to the positive. And I do want to say we're all trying very hard to um, create an, an opportunity for people to come into our town and for people to um, see and for us to showcase our town. And I ran into many individuals who uh, said they wanted to move to our town. So I hope the inconvenience it caused some businesses are was overshadowed by the opportunity for people who saw our town want to move here or come back and shop. Um, so it was a beautiful event. And I know all our city council people were there and, um, and, and very supportive. And then finally the rodeo was happening. So it was quite a weekend in Auburn and very exciting. What a, what a beautiful town we have. Um, so with that, I know um, Councilman Berlant has something to say. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Speaking of a beautiful town, I just wanted to uh, uh, pass on to everybody that uh, we are busy organizing our eighth annual Auburn Community Service Day. Uh, again, uh, this year we will be uh, partnered with the Auburn Arts Commission, which uh, has somewhat been the umbrella the last couple of years, uh, April Maynard, uh, Katie and Brian Fries and myself, uh, focusing on uh, the Auburn School Park Preserve, uh, which has gotten a lot of attention uh, based on vandalism uh, and some other issues. And so there'll be uh, trash pickup uh, on uh, some of the nearby roads. Uh, there'll be work within the school park preserve uh, as well. Uh, and we're working to, uh, uh, on the same day, do a fire uh, fuel reduction project. So um, hopefully you can all uh, sign up. Uh, the uh, Auburn Community Service Day is set for Saturday, May 14th. Uh, starting at 7.30 a.m. That is when registration uh, begins. 8 a.m. will actually start uh, the project. Uh, the work will go until noon, and then we will serve uh, free lunch in the park uh, at one o'clock. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll see all of you there. Uh, I definitely would encourage the council, uh, the city staff, uh, and anybody else uh, in the audience um, to, uh, to, uh, to join us. Again, uh, Saturday, May 14th, uh, Auburn Community Service Day. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you so much. Again, where do you sign up for that? Do, and, and is it required that they sign up? Yeah, I will um, uh, get the city clerk uh, the link so she can share, share with the council uh, as well as add it to the minutes. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, anyone else? Um, Mayor Sp or um, Councilwoman Riddell Harris or Councilman Spokely? Or... Yes, I do have something. Okay. Just... Um, uh, after Community Service Day, um, make sure you come to the State Theater and participate in their Staying Alive event. It's their fundraiser for the Auburn State Theater. And that will also be the evening of May 14th. So that'll be a fun event. It's all uh, themed in the 1970s disco. So looking forward to that. Is there anyone here that would like to speak, um, has a public comment or do we have any from um, mail, email? Oh, come on up forward, Mr. Tom. My name is Ray Thompson. I live at 1551 Auburn Ravine Road, formerly at 385 Blaster Street for 45 years, but had the opportunity to leave that spot. So I'm here to kind of ask a uh, somewhat odd question. I was in City Hall this morning talking with staff and building and planning concerning a request for an appeal on a project that was completed many years ago. Uh, staff informed me that the only way to create an appeal today, because typically appeals 
need to be filed within 10 days of an approval. Okay, well, here we are many, we are like mm -hmm. 30 years later. Oh my goodness. So <laughs> future inf information on this would follow if the, if you could direct staff to initiate an appeal, there's ample evidence and information that might justify what happened 30 years ago versus where we're at today. And some of the conditions might be modified, but it takes this board here and this, this council to approve anything like that. But staff needed from you the direction that it would be okay to initiate an appeal process because typically the appeal has to be filed within 10 days. Well, we're well over that time limit. So I know you can't act on that tonight, but we put that into the minutes and get it into the gin mill out here. And staff is fully aware of my issue and the uh, concerns that I would bring up. But anyway, as, as we get into this, there would be certainly more information to follow and more discussion. But, if, but I think, am I correct in assuming that staff needs something from you guys to initiate a later on in the process appeal? Um, um, I'm gonna defer to council. Yeah, I'll go ahead and, and jump in on that. Um, the council does not establish uh, whether or not an appeal can be filed. Those are already established in the building code would be the procedure, I believe, for what you're describing. Uh, they do sit as the board of appeals under the building code for a properly filed appeal for something that's happened 30 years ago it's unlikely that the facts 30 years ago could be the basis of an appeal however there might be some other avenues so i would encourage you to consult counsel if that is something you'd like to do do what your, i'm sorry on your appeal rights to consult counsel on your appeal rights i'm the lawyer for the city so i can't advise you on that yeah so he's suggesting that you might want to seek legal counsel yourself correct um, Gary, that's what you're saying. Correct. Um, on on whether or not I've kind of you can bring an appeal under certain circumstances that are that are significant to you. Granted, um, direction. I, anyway, I was led to believe that possibly counsel. I've had some counsel and gone over this with others. Does that counsel, that legal person need to come in here then? Um, not sure how that, what are the, pro, I, I what are the protocols that, for I that? I would think that your counsel would talk to our, the city city attorney, and then between the two of them, they can figure out if there's an avenue or an opportunity for an appeal. I know based there's, on there's your really no circumstances. Yeah, there's really no administrative remedy in staff. They right they have they have their they, guidelines their hands are tied <laughs> yeah but by, by the law but, but i i'm at optimistic this point, that there is but an every situation's unique and that's why our city attorney is saying consult counsel because your particular situation might be there might be something appropriate that the two of them can can, can i consult your counsel or do I need to be represented? I, I mean, it's no, kind you, of, I know this, the world is an odd world. I know, I understand, but. Uh, our, our counsel cannot advise you. You'd have to have your own counsel advise you because our counsel would advise the city council. Well, yeah, I know I, I, I can I cannot act as my own counsel. <laughs> I mean, he who has an attorney, you know, acts yes, as his own yes, attorney has a blah, blah, blah. That may not be the best. Well, but to, to at least air my circumstances to find out if I have a leg to stand on. I just, it's difficult to get opinions when there's nobody to talk to. <laughs> and, you know, what I believe versus what others believe. But anyway. Couldn't our council at least let him know what's allowed under our current guidelines and things if, if he wanted to ask our council specific questions about what's allowed under our building code, he could refer to our council to ask those kinds of questions. I would just recommend perhaps that you you maybe just get with our city manager. Yeah, so as to, to Council Member Rudell Harris's question, staff shouldn't have any issue talking about the current building code requirements. And I'm sure that the building official John May does that 
and would be available to do that on what the current building code requires. I don't think that's a problem. Um, there are appeal rights in the building code as well. And I'm sure that um, Mr. May can point you towards those as well. Yeah, I, 30 years ago, conditions that applied 30 years ago, though some of these conditions have changed and, but to make them change officially, got to go through the motions. But um, can I come in and chat with you for a few minutes? I'll just give you my overview of the whole thing, or is that you want me to get my own attorney? I, I have counsel. I have talked with an attorney just because it's gotten to be kind of a convoluted mess. Mr. Thompson, the, that's an appropriate question, but maybe you should do it email or call. Our attorney is very, very responsive. I'm not sure if this is the forum to. Okay. Well, I, the problem. reason I'm here is because I was led here tonight because it would take direction from you guys to start an appeal. And I wish we could. Years old. <laughs> I wish we could, but again, I think the best opportunity is either get counsel or you reach out to our attorney, and he's very responsive, or staff, and, right. and they're very, very. Well, I've, I've chatted with staff a bit, and they seem to have their hands tied, and I understand the situation that they're in, and we have to take it to another level. But okay, um, you'll hear from me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Thanks. thank you, Mr. Trump. Thank you, thank you. Is there any other um, public comment? Yes. Wait, 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 ma'am. Um, did you have a public comment? If you do, you need to step forward. No, yeah, you're being recorded. Just, if you don't mind, state your name and address, please. Sure. I'm Connie Ann Nickel. I sometimes use the AKA of Bovee. I'm currently located at 179 College Way, which is right up the street. And um, hopefully I might have some information to assist this gentleman. Uh, had well, been... the only, only thing is we, yeah. don't, we don't want to get into a discussion about that right here. Right. Do you have something else that you want to? Well, I have a very similar situation that didn't manifest itself uh, until all the dust had settled. And then it became obvious what the problem was. And uh, I do believe the legal term I have for it's called discovery. And so I'd been focusing on that for years. Unfortunately, it isn't in this area. It isn't in this state. It's in another state. But uh, I've Miss, Miss Nicholas, I, if you want to address the council about oh, I'm sorry, a particular comment, that'd be well, great. That's it. Uh, the law library here has been extremely helpful. Good. And the law librarian, uh, Diane, has been very helpful in that area. Great. She knows every book, every nook, every cranny. OK. And uh, I think that might be helpful to anybody. And I apologize. I don't really I love civics. I just don't know all the Okay. Thank you. Thanks. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Are there any other public comment? Thank you. Um, then we will go to council business ground leases for hangars at the Auburn airport given by our esteemed economic director, Jonathan Wright. Good evening, mayor. Good evening, mayor. Good evening, council members and virtual council members. Mm -hmm. Um, Appreciate your time tonight. Jonathan Wright, Economic and Planning Manager. Okay, we got it up. We're just gonna move right into this because this shouldn't take very long. So contained in your packet this evening is a memo, a draft memo that I put together uh, in response to many of the concerns that we hear or heard last year at the stakeholder meetings. Um, what I'm seeking this evening is direction. And uh, if I can publish this, because I'd really like to get this information out to the airport community. As we went through the stakeholder engagement process, both John and I, it became very apparent that we had two different types of, of uh, interests. One of them dealt with the, directly in the airport, which was dealing with maintenance and those types of issues. And the other one was our leases. And there seemed to be a lot of questions surrounding leases, what the city could do for them, what we can't do. Um, what reversion means, a lot, of, a lot of things that we're gonna go over this evening and a lot of things that are contained in this, this memo here. So mainly they wanna know about cost. You know, what, what ultimately is gonna be the cost for ground leases? What is gonna be the cost for um, improved leases, which are those that, that then transfer ownership? 
um, to the city on behalf of the airport. What does reversion mean for a hangar owner? What is a maximum term for a ground lease and what actions can we do for them? So we've already started this process. So the first one we we're talking about um, what we can do, or excuse me, what the, the rents might be or what is it gonna cost? Uh, we initiated that process when we got the, um, uh, the appraisal for the airport. And the next step in that is going to be to publish a fee schedule. So that'll be a comprehensive fee schedule that comes back before the city council is adopted and then is put out on the website there. That way, anybody that comes to the community or any of our current um, tenants out there have full transparency. It's all out there. If they want to rent a room, if they want to, you know, whatever it, it might be, those things would all be included in that document. So we're already moving forward with that, uh, but I wanted to put it in this memo so that people are aware that, that we have that if they're not. Also the fact that we're gonna be obligated to maintain that and what does that look like? So every couple of years we go back and look at if, if our rates are keeping up with current market. The other thing to look at, or one of the concerns was again with transparency is what does market mean? And so this, this actually, I think won us some favor out at the airport because we were very specific with the appraiser and said, we want to have something that's representative of our area. You know, we're not looking at San Francisco International Airport. We're talking about Auburn. So we're looking at Placerville. We're looking at Grass Valley. We're looking at, at those other airports, which is exactly what they did. So those costs that you see up there, those relative costs are very similar to what you'd see at other airports uh, in the surrounding area. And so that has been already vet to the airport community and that's readily available to them. Reversion's the big one. I mean, that's uh, it's it's right up there with a four-letter word, even though it's not a four-letter word. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what is what does reversion really mean? Well, upon the the termination or the expiration of a lease, um, that lease would then go to the underlying landowner. In this case, the underlying landowner is the city of Auburn, and so that at the end, the improvements, which we're dealing directly with hangar leases um, with this informational memo, that improvement would then go to the ownership of the city. And what does that mean for a tenant? Well, the tenant, you know, at the expiration, we would then talk to them about what an improved lease might look like for them based off the, the fee schedule that we would then have available um, for them. And why is reversion required? Well, ground leases revert. Um, Anybody who's, who's dealt with leases knows that the underlying property owner has an interest in the property. And even if you build a, uh, a mega mall on top of it, at some point that would go back to the, the underlying property owner, unless there's some other type of agreement worked out. Um, unfortunately, we're dealing with city, city owned property that is federally obligated because uh, we are a sponsor to the airport, which means we receive FAA funding. And as an FAA funded, airport, we have some assurances that we've given the FAA. And one of the, the first assurances is the maintaining control of the airport. Those are versionary clauses allow us the ability to, if things modify significantly out there through an airport layout plan, uh, a safety issue that's arrived, it, it affords us the opportunity to seize control of that property and do what we need to do. The other thing is that it's available for public use. So, and by doing that, having terms on the leases allows for property to turn over, making it available to other users that may not have that opportunity otherwise to use the airport. Uh, Assurance 24, and the self-sustaining piece. So again, we receive FAA funding and their goal is to make us as self-sustaining as possible so we're not reliant on federal dollars. And by having that reversion clause in there, that changes our economic structure from the, the ground leases to improved leases, which is considerably higher. Uh, granted, you know, it sounds like a good deal, but again, we would have a lot of maintenance responsibility. We would really have to, to gear up for, uh, for that type of scenario, but ultimately we would be driving, I won't say we, the airport enterprise fund would be driving a higher amount of revenue uh, in return for those, those structures. And, and really the, the nexus there is to, that if we fail to do so, we could jeopardize our funding with the FAA and there's a, a couple of examples out there, including um, Shreveport, I think it was Louisiana, that, that actually came in and got um, penalized by the FAA, audited, penalized, and um, jeopardized funding because they were not exercising the reversion clauses in their lease. So one of the, one of the things that we kept hearing, or I kept hearing out there was, you know, why are we doing this? We're the only ones that are, that are doing this. That's not accurate. 
we've done a lot of a lot of research and there's a lot of information out there and as a, as an obligated airport we're under the same guidelines as all the other airports in fact if you look and um google uh, chico about three years ago they had a new um airport manager that came in realized that the, either the reversion clauses weren't in their leases they weren't being exercised and really i mean it, it started a, a major um amount of concern with the landowners out there, but they, they were moving it in that direction, realizing that, that FAA requires it um, and that it's, it's part of the practice of owning a, uh, or, or operating um, as a sponsor of an airport. So really the only time you'd ever see this potentially happen or not happen would be if it was a private, uh, private uh, airport, or if it was maybe outside of the state of California and there's, there's certain parameters we'll go into here in a minute. Um, so the uh, airport owners and pilots association put out some good information. We actually met with them and a couple of members of uh, the stakeholder group that, that we've been dealing with, with the, uh, or discussing leases with, um, and they were very forthcoming about leases. You know, you get to a point where we're researching all these avenues, we're working for our clients, you know, to the best benefit of the airport community. And you get to that point where you're, you're almost kind of like, shoot, you know, I was right. Um, because you're looking for those solutions and maybe those 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 gray areas where you can work with your clients to try to help it out. But they were very clear that that what we've been doing, the information that we have and the information that's contained in this memo is accurate. And they put out disclaimers. You can see right there, if you're thinking about buying a hangar, it's a buyer beware because many places, well, almost all places out there, the underlying property owner at some point is going to come and that that could revert. Uh, and that's a good that's a good lesson because we are getting to the point where we have a lot of 40 year leases out there and some of them are gonna to get to the point where they're gonna start turning over, we get to a certain place. And so that's good information for people to be aware of. So what is the FAA's stance on term? Which term means the duration of the leases? Because you know, the, the nexus for a reversion is the, the lease of terminate. And so FAA, it, it, this is again through the uh, Airport Owners and Pilots Association website, um, and this is information we, they don't, they don't nail you down to a, a certain date. They see generally that 30 to 35 years is what they're looking for in the way of lease terms. That's FAA. But in no case do we want to go beyond 50 years. And that's a number that you actually see in California state statute. So if you look at actual government code, which is what we're dictated under, um, it specifically states that we shall not issue leases that exceed 50 years. And again, and I have it highlighted for the construction. And maintenance of, of hangars. So we are bound by that by law. That is the ceiling that we have um, to work under. So what can we do for our, our leases, uh, our tenants out there? We can do assignments, amendments, restatements. So you, you've seen a lot of the assignments already. We have a lot of sales that have gone on or transfers. So those have come before you. Um, recently, we had an amendment. Those take a little bit more time. Some of them require a lot more negotiation. Um, Gary Bell and I have spent a lot of time with, with one tenant out there and, and, and a number of, uh, not at the airport, but in the, the industrial park on certain matters. So the amendments can get, can get, can be pretty labor intensive. And then a restatement is basically that we're doing a material change, we're materially changing the lease and either the applicant or by pure nexus or need to redraft it. You're basically having the same lease parameters, but you're redrafting the lease. And then of course, what can we do for, for new tenants? Well, we can issue a ground lease like we did the other day for the, the new um, six hanger rows out there. And we can do now at some point in the future, we're gonna have to, to look at new and improve, or improved leases. Uh, one of the things I didn't go into in the bullet points, but it was a question that originally started out um, from the airport communities. Why are we charging people to do these actions? Well, uh, Auburn Airport is an enterprise fund. So basically what, what we're obligated to do is is operate it like a business. So lease actions that are requested, that um, like the ones that the assignments, all those, those are requested by the applicant, and those are not included in the lease provisions. There's no place in there where we say, hey, at some point if you want to come back, you get a you know a freebie. It's it requires additional cost. It takes my time. It takes uh, legal counsel's time. So in some cases, it's required to bring in a, a real estate agent to get involved with it, or a consulting. Uh, real estate agent or an appraiser. And so as an example there, we actually had an assignment that, that ran $4,000 in legal fees and time, but we're not, it's not necessarily a fee, we're just recovering cost. And since I've been here, we've done a great job. I think um, almost all of the, well, all, of, all the uh, actions we've done, we've gotten a deposit on 
and that has met our obligation. We're, we're streamlining things, we're making it easier, so it's becoming more and more uh, less expensive for our clients to get through these processes. So, again, I wanted to bring this to your or bring this to your attention today, and seek direction uh, because that that document I would love to send out to the airport community. But I want to know if there's anything that, that you would like specifically addressed in it. Again, we, we hit the, the major parameters there, term, reversion, rates, and then the additional information that we provide on, on actions and, and why we're charging for them. Um, if there's something I can do to make this better, but I'd, I'd love to finalize it, get it out to the airport community. And, and I use this as a tool. Uh, because we have this now draft, it's it's in memo form. But you know, if, if I get run over by a bus tomorrow, then somebody actually knows the research that's been done and can carry out this job, and it increases consistency. When when I came into this position, that wasn't available, and it would have been really helpful if we had some information like this because we could really move forward with things. So um, it's out there, and I'm seeking um, council direction. Thank you. I appreciate your effort to bring us a policy. Um, so with that, do we have any questions? Um, Councilman Spokely? Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you, Jonathan, for the presentation. Um, I, I got to imagine the whole reversion discussion didn't go over very well out there with some of our lease ease. Can you just briefly describe how that conversation has gone, is still going? Well, as you can tell by the, uh, the reassignments, we've had a number of, of um, properties change hands. And so that's where we get a number of the questions from the new people that have just bought, you know, what does this mean? You know, because we have some legacy folks out there that were part of the original group that originally started the leases in the 90s and some of them in the 80s. Um, and they've held on to it that long. They seem to be more aware, although they're kind of curious on what the current circumstance is. Um, like I said, the, the first meeting that we had of stakeholder group, we actually paired the group apart at the end because we had this very concerned group of, of leasehold tenants. And, and John and I actually stayed the extra hour after the stakeholder meeting to really listen and, and take in the information and try to figure out what the concerns were there. We then spent some time and reported back to them. Even since then, there's been more questions coming back and forth. So that, that, was, that was really the nexus for having a document that was, that was written that we could hand out to everybody for consistency. Um, I, I might also point out, uh, Jonathan hit on it. There are many people out there where their leases are coming to that reversion. Uh, we're getting to that 30 year period. And that's what's driving a lot of this question. Jonathan's right on. There are a lot of people who uh, are aware of them. Uh, probably some of the biggest questions have been uh, brought up by people who really weren't sure. Uh, maybe they uh, uh, assumed the lease from uh, somebody. And that's why getting this information, uh, as Jonathan's put it, in writing, explaining everybody what their options are. Um, you know, it's not like we want to kick anybody out, but, you know, realize that there are some people that have had these leases now for over 30 years. So it's what's driving the conversa conversation on the, the, the reversion. And uh, you know, right now, for some of these folks, they're also selling uh, their, their their leases to people. So uh, <clears> it's why uh, getting a, a really well written, straight up, this is how we're dealing with this stuff. Um, are some people happy? Eh, no, not really. Uh, some of the folks will just tell it as it is. So you mean I have to buy my hanger back? And the answer to that question is yes, mostly. But uh, that's the way that it was set up. But ultimately, I think there's latitude in there. And, and Jonathan's actually done a really good job of just talking about some of the ideas of reinvestment. Um, once, once we get to that reverted lease, there's a way for them to probably uh, get a balance on uh, the land lease and, and then the new improved lease. But those are all things that I think we just need to work out. So, so I would imagine the existing lease structure that we have for some of the old ones in particular, they have some sort of escalator or market reset like we talk about in your memo. Are those things going on out there? So as far as the lease structure currently out there, they're on a five-year increment. So they're flat rate for five years. Then you do a market reset or adjust, which we use CPI 
Um, so at that point, we adjust for the previous five years, and then they get a new rate based on whatever that inflation factor looks like, and then it goes for another five year. Uh, the mark, the actual market reset is not built into those um, new releases. Like we just did the the ground lease, there is a provision in there that allows for market reset, but the older ones there there is not. And and that, if you want to read into it, that that uh, memo that I put out before, looking at the rates and showing where we are and compared to other places. Is, is probably has to do a lot with that. Yeah, there, there, there's some people that are, they're out there on some pretty advantageous deals and uh, a, a prospect on, on one, probably the one that's eaten up most of our time, they're paying about 11 cents a foot. Mm -hmm. So uh, over the course of that 30 years, uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of adjustment. Now you talk about the, the FAA allows, or maybe I've read that wrong, but you know, no more than a 50 year lease. Does that include any extensions to the lease? The state statute does not allow us to go beyond 50 years. And that, that's, I really wanted to be clear with that in this document because we are limited by law to what we can provide. And so the, the thought that we can just extend a lease beyond 50 years or just continue to extend a lease doesn't exist. Um, and that that's really explained in this document because I want it to be clear that we can't go past that. What would happen is it terms out. So at the end of the 50 years, we, well, we wouldn't issue a lease for longer than 50 years anyways, but at the end of the 50 years, then the term ends and it, it would revert at that point. Now, what we would do with that person, great tenant, you know, been working on the, the structure, whatever, we're going to work to issue them a new lease for that, but it's going to be sure. improved. <laughs> okay. Um, all in all, oh, I'll, I'll hold off on comments. Okay. All in all, I, I love the idea. I love the memo. Um, I can see how it's raising a bunch of eyebrows. So um, particularly from, for some of those long-term leases. Yep. John, I think it was your first or second day. We got a phone call from um, somebody that I do business with that wanted a hundred year lease or something out at the airport. And um, that, that's the, just so you know that uh, this will be an inside joke, but that same person came or this, the same folks came in last week and offered us to sell that building to us. <laughs> for for twelve million dollars, it was like mm, no. Excellent, Jonathan. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, and I do appreciate all the work that you've done and put into this, Jonathan. I know um, that there's been a lot of meetings and discussions, so thank you so very much. And I agree with you. Having something in writing that so, sort of sets the um, the stage and provides that background information is very helpful. A couple of things, just I wanted to um, uh, kind of uh, taxi on uh, Councilman Spokely's comment with regards to the 50 year leases. The lease, we can't go beyond 50 years for an existing lease, but we can renegotiate a new lease that could be for another 50 years the, with the, the limit, same person. The limit's 50 years, but it would no longer be a ground lease because at that point, at the point of terminating one lease to issue a new lease, reversion would take place. So it's a lease for the building. So then it would, the new, the new one be for improved, which would be the building and the, and the yes. But it, I mean, <clears throat> my point is, is that the individual could still yes. stay there. There's an opportunity for them to stay there and to utilize that structure beyond 50 years. It's just under a brand new lease. And so I think maybe if we could really make that crystal clear in the, in the document and, and you might have, and I apologize, I did read it um, last night. But I think that's really important is that we cannot, the, the lease certainly cannot extend past 50 years, but you can negotiate a new lease for the land and the structure so that, you know, for another 50 years, if you wanted to. So just so it's crystal clear, because I know that Councilman Spokely and I both had that same question. Yeah. Um, the other thing is I, I wanted to ask you about this, about um, reversion. This is, did we incorporated, we've always incorporated this in our leases, correct? Historically. Correct. correct. Okay. So that's important to note. Um, I think what also might be helpful in the document is to cite the specific provisions of either the law or the regulations that were adopted by FAA that talks about reversion. So that it's very clear in the presentation, for example, you have the, you cite the section of state law and um, that deals with the 50 year leases. That way, it, it doesn't look like it's an interpretation of ours or what, what have you. It's crystal clear. Here's what federal law or regulations say. You can read it for yourself. But the fact is, is that we are an obligated airport. And in order to maintain that status, which allows us to get federal funding, we have to comply with these rules 
that they've established and just cite that. I think that that just really takes the argument out of anything because that's what the law says. The FAA is very clear about being unclear. <laughs> so you have you have a number of policy statements there and you derive what the intent is by their actions and what they've done to other airports. That's why I cite Shreveport and some of the other ones around because they, they will not state specifically in policy how reversion is to take place. They give us the policy standards and say, by those standards that I listed out there, you are to in, interpret it to mean that that reversion should be in there. The, the bottom line is any leases out there, any, any ground leases, whether it be private or public, almost any, have a reversion clause in there that reverts the interest back to the landowner. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have no different than anybody else. Those clauses are in ours. And really the thing to concentrate on is the term, because once that term is up, then that's when that, that mm -hmm. nexus is for it to, to take place. Um, it, I, I search everywhere to try to get my finger on something from the FAA. Mm -hmm. Like I said, there's plenty of information, policy documents or policy information about how they've enforced it, but we do not find, we don't have anything directly in there that specifically states you must revert. Could we, could we maybe have like a, a footnote or a citation of those sure. precedent setting issues then? I just think the, you know, again, and I'm, it's unfortunate that the FAA is so gray on that, but I, I just, I think the, the, the more information that you can point to that, the less you'll have for, you know, accusation that we're just acting, you know, out of our own interpretation. Um, and I, it would it might be beneficial to maybe talk to some larger airports like you know Sac County, and um, and find out you know what what how are they citing it? So I would encourage you to reach out to them if, if you need a contact with them. Please see me. We'll, sure. We can talk about that afterwards. But you know because obviously that's a huge airport. Um, I, I don't did reach out to our local. They have. I did reach out to our local airports and have had conversations with the local managers. So, yeah, and just that. huh? But not Sacramento. Yeah, but not Sac. I mean. And I don't know what kind of private hangers they, it might be SAC Executive Airport might be more appropriate, but still the Department of Airports at SAC County, might, it might just be beneficial to see exactly what language they're using and, and what, you know, they might be citing other cases or what have you. Again, it's just a matter of ensuring that we have as much evidence as possible to, to point there so that people aren't just thinking it's our interpretation. I understand it's not just our interpretation. And it's unfortunate it's not in law, but um, that's really my comment on this. I think it, you know, just logistically, it, it, it's, it's an interesting concept in that, you know, an investor is going to spend the money on their hangar, they're going to lease the land, but then they're going to have to give up that investment to the city. And so I think just giving them as much information as possible as to the, the, the requirements for that would be helpful because okay. it doesn't really happen in any other circumstance as far as i i know it's pretty isn't it pretty um is it unique to airports or i mean i think about other other situations i, I can tell you on the federal level it's not unique no. uh, uh, all, all the concessionaires uh who operate uh, on state land it's the same thing so i mean not airport so like <clears throat> state you mean uh, like for example uh well, I'll give, I'll give you the like best state example. parks or, or like uh, Lake Berryessa. Uh -huh. uh, there were nine resort operators up there and uh, they all were on the same leases and wham, bam, all of a sudden they decided everybody out and uh, literally they moved almost uh, the BOR moved to almost, I think, 3000 trailers. Uh, that yeah. uh, everything had just reverted back. So, yeah. So they just, I'm, was it reversion because the leases expired or was it reversion because they were the landowner, for, just simply because for, they were the landowner? For the concessionaires of uh, of each one of the resorts, it, it was uh, the lease ended and everything reverted. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I would just add on a much shorter time period and for different reasons, school districts do lease lease back arrangements for construction of different school facilities to get around some other requirements that might apply to those public works. And it's a similar thing. Lease okay. it, improvements are built at the end of it, the improvements then transfer ownership to the school district. Well, that's helpful then because it's not just then unique to airports. Then. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. Ben. I thank you very much. All right, so th that's really, Jonathan, my suggestion on that. But otherwise, I think it's a, a great document, and I appreciate that and, and look forward to it getting released. Okay, I'll put some more work into it. Thank you. Um, Councilman Berlant or Riddell? Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, I agree completely with uh, Councilwoman Down in Calvillo as far as 
um, understanding that it's not great, but if there's statute or regulations that or, or FAA policy that you can immediately cite, because um, it doesn't make sense, I think, to the common sense. And so having something that is cited there, I think, would, would help tremendously. Uh, my only question, and it kind of dovetails on what uh, Councilwoman Donna Calvillo just asked, which is related to uh, after a revision occurs, the new leases. Uh, I know you spell it out on page two uh, that there is still the opportunity for uh, the current tenant to continue to occupy their leased uh, area. But is there some reassurance uh, that we can give that says that a current tenant has priority um, in negotiating for an additional lease, making sure that you know they don't think they've invested all this money, not over a fifty-year span, but right if somebody bought it just five years ago, uh, or you know it's got was subleased into it, they've done all this work and and now it's gone. Is there some reassurance as far as prioritizing them to be able to? be the, 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 the sole or the primary person that gets to negotiate for really their, their building on our land. What if they're not a good tenant though? <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's valid, but I mean, I guess that's more of a legal question related to the, the funding, the money they've put into the infrastructure improvements. So, so many of them, not all, many of them have a first right of refusion, refusal clause in them that would allow us to engage them at that point. It would be built into the lease. Now, I guess I would tell somebody if it wasn't built into the lease and they bought it and they had five years left and that was their intent that they would come to um, city, come to the city and talk to us and we maybe would look to put something in there, do an amendment to, to help them with that so that they knew that their investment was protected. Okay, uh, that's all my questions. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank, Thank you. you, Jonathan. Uh, Councilman, Councilwoman Riddell Harris. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I think that all the other council members have done a pretty good job covering the basis. I just wanted to say thank you to Jonathan for all of his hard work on this. He's really done a great job. Uh, same with the city manager. I know that there were, uh, being out at those meetings, it wasn't exactly a friendly environment to start out with. And so I think that they both did an excellent job of talking to and really listening to what the folks out at the airport needed and wanted and really did a great job of providing that information to them. So I wanted to say thank you to them and thank you to staff everyone who's worked on this, I think this is a really good result um, from a kind of a tough situation when they walked in the door. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and I just have, um, maybe it's an obvious question. So when, when you uh, renegotiate, can leases be less than 50 years or do they have to be at least 50 years? No, most of the leases are less than 50 years out there. Okay. They're like so, the standard's 40 um, for most of those. Okay. So uh, an individual can, uh, reach the end of his lease and then renegotiate a 10 year lease if he would like, or if, if there's, if we have a, a, the availability of remaining term, then we can look at, at doing a process to, to help them out. Um, what I've, I've told the airport community, because, you know, as soon as they hear that you have a bunch of people that have 30 years left on their, their lease and they're immediately trying to do it. There are some out there. They're going to expire in the next two to three years. In fact, you'll see one at the next uh, meeting. So I'm trying to put first things first and work with those on an as needed basis. So um, we're, we're not to that point. Plus, there, if you look at the structures in 30 years, they could look much different. And because they are going to be property of the city, we wouldn't want to lose the ability to negotiate with them about improvements when it comes closer to that time. So it would not be in the interest of the city for us to do that at this point for some of those. Right. Some of them we, need, we definitely need to dive in on. Okay, thank you. And yeah, I, I think what you have proposed is, is wonderful. Um, I think it's very, you need to be very, very clear and you are, uh, especially with the reversions and, the, and, and that it can't exceed 50 years. I think you're very clear. You, you put that in several times. You're very clear on the terminology. Um, so I really support what you've done here. Very good. Thank you very much for your effort you, and all your hard work in this. Um, so is that enough? I have, I have enough direction. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Public comment. Is there anyone from the public that has a question? Okay. Um, there's none. There will be none that came in. Okay. Thank you very much. So with that, we will go to city manager report. 
Mayor and Council, just a couple of items very quickly. Uh, the capital improvement program, which was going to be tonight at five, uh, is going to come back on the 23rd, uh, May 23rd. Uh, it just, uh, it, it was not even half baked. It wasn't even stirred yet. Um, so um, uh, lots to it. Uh, and I can tell you the staff's working very hard on the overall capital improvement program that's going to come before you, but it just wasn't ready to go. Um, the mayor mentioned, uh, I think everything on earth happened over the weekend of the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. Um, just a, a report out on the canyons. Uh, we're going to schedule a debrief uh, with uh, the Ironman UTMB team. Uh, also, we'll include all of our partners from uh, the chamber and, and uh, uh, downtown association. Uh, everybody uh, will probably send a little survey out to some of the businesses just to uh, ask them for their input and everything. Um, I can't say enough for the work of people uh, like um, uh, Jackie Weston did a great job. Uh, Lori Tompkins uh, uh, in April with the downtown uh, association uh, visit Placer and, and, and Rob and, and all of them, they really came together and uh, some of the things that we got from some people that absolutely have juice with uh, Iron Man were sending uh, nothing but accolades uh, on everything. Uh, Jonathan uh, and our entire maintenance uh, team on the city side uh, really came through on everything. Amy, for her work on the website. Um, uh, and next year, they're going to add a 100-mile race onto uh, the thing. But uh, uh, first-class organization. Sure? for sure? Yes. Will it start and end in Auburn? Yeah, I'm trying to figure that out. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I can't read maps very well, but it sure does. Councilman like. Spokely doesn't want to just get up at five in the morning. He wants to see the finish. It's going to start in Auburn, but it, it won't end in Auburn. It'll, they're going to add on some mileage and cool and make a, another lollipop when I yeah. spoke to them, Chaz, about that. Yeah, that there's change. kind of a, a, a loopy thing that they're doing. Um, but over the weekend, I just want to give some, a shout out to the uh, uh, Rotary Club of Auburn. Uh, they had a work day. Uh, where they were really went and uh, they went at one of the Campus of Hope locations for a gathering in. Uh, they did a mural. They put up walls. They did a lot of things. Um, very proud of my association with the Rotary Clubs here. Uh, last week, we funded a um, solar project on an orphanage for uh, developmentally disabled uh, people down in um, uh, Ensenada in Mexico. We're going to take a road trip down there and go see them do that. But um, Good people doing good things. Uh, the mayor pointed out Earth Day that was on the 22nd. That was from the Placer High School Environmental Club. Really good kids in that group. Uh, they work hard. They're very committed. Uh, it was a very nice event, and I can't say enough for them. They they worked hard. Uh, that was on, on Friday. Honestly, I wish it would uh, Earth Day's Earth Day, but uh, uh, like I said, everything happened last week, so they lost some of that. Um, shout out to the rodeo Echo Valley Ranch. Uh, I don't think there's uh, a business in town that works harder on just pumping everything for this town. Uh, business vitality over the weekend was insane. Anybody who tried to go anywhere, old town, downtown, um, uh, everybody was having a good time, but I think you were bound to be frustrated because uh, everything was just, I, I took a, a drive through, uh, um, town, um, uh, about 5 30 ish on on saturday and the place was just rocking uh so that's just uh, a, a credit for all of our businesses and uh things that are going on uh just for the council uh look at your email may 19th is the plaster uh, county city dinner uh, down in roseville so if you can um look at your email uh, uh if you want just shoot an email to uh, Amber and she will get you signed up. Uh, so uh, with that, um, overall a good weekend. Uh, just uh, I, uh, uh, you never want to say too many nice things about the attorney, but uh, Gary and Jonathan both on the airport staff. Um, our commitment to the airport community is very real, and as we've told uh, some people, you know, realize th th these aren't. These aren't ordinary people out at the airport. They are folks who are very savvy business people. We have told them that we were going to uh, 
clarify and fix many of the things. And uh, I can tell you that the amount of work that uh, Gary has put in, Jonathan has put in, and also many, many of our stakeholders out there have really contributed uh, quite a bit. So uh, I think uh, uh, tonight getting the input from the council are putting some things in place that are, are going to be a, a part of really building that relationship. But uh, I, I can't say enough for the work of Gary and Jonathan, um, just, just quality staff work on things. And um, that's my report. I have a quick question uh, on the May 23rd community um, uh, capital improvement plan discussion. It'll start at five o'clock. We will be starting at five o'clock uh, next, uh, the next meeting. And then also that one. Now, will, will that, will the capital improvement plan be um, policy or is it the budget? It'll be the budget. Okay. It'll be the budget. So uh, uh, we're actually breaking it out. There'll be a little nuance that the council can give us on various things, but at the end of the day, we're going to bring seven core areas of capital improvement projects. You'll actually see uh, uh, the, the entire program spread out over about a five-year period. Uh, we're still working a little bit of stuff as far as our overall revenue projections on things, but uh, we will bring in the actual program to the council. And like I said, you'll be able to nuance some of the things. Uh, there's uh, a couple of things that are still being worked on, uh, namely, uh, um, the, the first two years of the CIP involve quite a bit of assessment. We're doing, as an example, sewer collection system. We are doing a lot of improvements on those things, but I'm, I'm just being really straight with you. We are going to, uh, until we actually get the full assessment of, of the, whether it's the collection system or whether it's storm drainage, uh, we are, we're, we're going to identify revenues, but uh, we, we're going to wait until after the assessments for total funding on them. So it, it'll, the, the, the CIP will be very dynamic in a couple of areas. So. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, Councilwoman, and this is now time for City Council Committee reports. Um, Councilwoman Dowden Cavillo. Yes, thank you very much. I have a couple of things to report. Uh, first of all, just as an FYI to Council, there are two pieces of legislation pending in the Assembly, AB 1944 and AB 2449, that would amend the Brown Act with regards to meetings like this, where you have the ability to, to do a hybrid meeting and to do a meeting remotely. Um, specifically, they would uh, amend the provisions on the noticing requirement. Uh, right now we're in that, we have that gray area because we're in a state of emergency where we can have these meetings remote without having to have the notice posted outside of the location where the individuals are being in their meeting at their home, for example. So um, uh, Pioneer Energy is following those two pieces of legislation, but um, I would, uh, Gary, if you're, those aren't on your radar, it might be a good idea to make sure that they are. Um, hopefully they'll get out of the policy committee <laughs> and move along and we can see those changes made permanently to allow us all the flexibility to, to continue these remote meetings or these hybrid meetings. Um, we did have our Pioneer Energy meeting last week, Pioneer, Pioneer Community Energy. Very excited to say that they will be uh, launching a, a revised website. It's a great website, very user-friendly um, within the next month. So look for that in May. Um, the Placer County Transportation and Planning Agency meets on Wednesday. One of the things that we will be hearing um, about is the key findings from a survey that was conducted April 10th through the 16th of 2022 with regards to the potential South Placer transportation sales tax measure. You'll remember that uh, this is something that they looked at a couple of years ago. There was a, it would be an additional sales tax for um, transportation uh, improvements, mainly out on 65. The city of Auburn, Loomis, Colfax wasn't going to be included in that sales tax increase, um, but we would have uh, receive some of those funding. They were willing to provide us with some of that funding. But in any event, they're still, they're still on the table. They're still considering it. And they did conduct a, a, another survey, April 10th and 16th. So we'll be hearing a presentation on that to see how close they're going to be to, to, uh, to launching that, if at all. Um, last thing, or we have a meeting of the State Historic um, uh, Shack, the, um, and that's this week. One thing to note, the tile costs have actually almost doubled from what they used to be. 
Um, and so we'll be talking about that issue because right now Shack was charging $1,500 per tile because the actual cost was about $750 and uh, the other $750 that they uh, collected was to help pay for the historic tiles where there wasn't an individual to pay for that cost. So they're gonna have to come up with a, perhaps a different funding recommendation, maybe additional monies asking from the city council. And then um, the Western States Trail Museum continues to move forward. Uh, they did have a building assessment done and uh, recently received the results of that building assessment for 1103 High Street. They did that uh, per the city manager's request. And so uh, I haven't actually had a chance to open that document up, but they have done that and they continue to move forward. And I know that that will be something that comes up for us pretty quickly. So that's all that I have to report. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Spokley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. A uh, couple of quick items. Uh, we did have a SACOG board meeting last week. Uh, big items on the agenda were the 2022-2023 regional funding um, budget and revolving match program guidelines uh, that the board approved. Uh, this is for the four county area. It does not include PCTPA or El Dorado County um, in, that, in that funding round. So it's a little odd that we vote on that as a, as a COG, but we do. And um, the other item that was, um, we spent quite a bit of time talking about was the uh, framework for a new plan that SACOG is working on. It's a regional trail network plan kind of linking all all uh, six counties together as best as possible with uh, with um, trail networks um, so it was nice to make the announcement about the canyon run uh, to the SACOG board right after we heard and kind of gave direction on that item um, I believe that's all I've got to report thank you thank you um, Councilman Berlant all right, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll add to Council Member Spokley's uh, list. Uh, the two of us, as well as our city manager, did attend the uh, Placer County Regional Homeless Ad Hoc uh, meeting that occurred uh, just last week. It was a really good discussion with all of the uh, city council members, uh, as well as their city managers, to kind of regroup and figure out how do we kind of get get that uh, group back in a functional manner that uh, can, can really work on those phase two strategies. Uh, so lots of good discussions, more to, more to come, but just wanted to let you know that um, that group is gonna get together. Uh, we also decided that uh, because of the focus that was needed to really beef up uh, that phase one plan, mm -hmm. uh, the ad hoc group is actually gonna start meeting weekly. Um, with one of those meetings being in person every single month. Um, and so that should help with some of the open communication and, and dialogue, but also the, the weekly uh, uh, tenor, I think will help show that this is a priority that all the cities want to see, um, want to see uh, goals, uh, timelines set for, for that phase two. So uh, more to come on that, but uh, that's going to become a very active uh, group for council member Spokley and I and our city manager. Uh, lastly, uh, we skipped uh, we skipped last meeting's update, so I just wanted to quickly brief out on the Auburn Arts Commission. Uh, they met uh, earlier in the month, and man, they have an exhausting list of projects that they are working on. So, I, I, just to name a couple, they're working to develop a first of its kind, at least in our area, a literary event. Uh, Patricia Caspers, who you may know, uh, she used to work for the Auburn Journal and now is a librarian. She's trying to head up having a literary event, which is, again, uh, there's a lot of photo galleries, there's a lot of uh, music uh, and, and other public art, but literary um, is, is not one of those. And so that is, um, that is underway. Uh, lots coming, uh, being planned for the summer. Uh, lots of uh, music uh, that uh, they are working on with the DBA. Uh, improvements to Central Square, specifically to the uh, fish uh, statue, uh, as I mentioned, Auburn Community Service Day. But one last item that was a topic of conversation that I just want to share with, with the four of you. Um, the Arts Commission has a number of projects uh, that we have approved uh, or that we have seen uh, down in the Auburn School Park Preserve. And there's some, some pretty serious concern that they have um, related to vandalism, related to damage uh, that could be done uh, to these projects. And so I think I'd already previously mentioned uh, that 
Uh, the mayor and I met with our police chief and city manager to talk about some of the efforts that could occur down at uh, Auburn School Park Preserve. But I just wanted to flag for, for you uh, that those projects in Auburn School Park Preserve are still moving forward, uh, but there is a lot of concern uh, related to the amount of crime and vandalism that is occurring. Of course, that's why the Auburn Arts Commission and the Auburn Community Service Day is focused on on the park uh, come, um, come May 14th. So um, hopefully that can uh, set the park off to uh, a, a good stance, but a lot more is gonna need to be done. So uh, Madam Mayor, with that, uh, end of report, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Berlant. Um, Councilwoman Riddell Harris. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I, I had two quick meetings. Uh, one is the Placer County Economic Development Board. We met last week and uh, talked about business retention and expansion. They've been working on that project for a little while, meeting with different businesses. And um, I've been working with them to schedule some meetings as well. Um, and also they, ta they talked about the regional workforce and some efforts that are being done locally by uh, Center of Excellence, Sierra College, and then also uh, the new head of the Ro Roseville Chamber came in and talked about some chamber activities. So um, that was a great presentation, very informative there. I also um, met with the Auburn Economic Development Commission. We talked more about um, the branding plan that is gonna be brought to the council next meeting. Um, and then also uh, making progress on our new uh, process for grants that we're gonna be putting out um, and also our budget and those kind of things that we've been working on. So other than that, I think uh, that's about it. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Riddell Harris. Um, and I had, um, a couple of meetings, um, sustainability met, and we talked about our website and the website, I encourage everyone, it's, it's a dynamic website. It's sustainauburn.org. If you get a chance, please go on it, check it out. Um, it's very informative, informative, interactive. It's, it's just excellent. One of these days I'll um, flash up some of it. Um, they, the presentation on plastics will be a lot of, will be there. And, um, and it's as good as Truckee's website, so. And that's pretty good. Um, so the other thing is um, we spent, after um, our city manager left, we spent half the meeting trying to figure out the acronym ICLE. Um, don't ask me what it means, but we are members and um, we are going to be doing um, a lot of the um, uh, greenhouse, um, uh, checklists for, for our city. So he's looking it up right now too, see? Uh, but he'll let us know in a minute what it stands for. Um, so that was important. And then the, um, the other one exciting um, committee I got involved with was when Auburn Ravine behind City Hall here gets polluted a lot. Um, there's a lot of, um, of um, dumping that, that occurs and, and we have concerns, uh, citizens of Auburn that started a little anti-pollution group and our police chief was attending for a while. And I've been keeping, trying to keep that up to listen to their concerns. Our staff is very helpful when there's an issue. Uh, they try and uh, minimize the damage um, and have it go so that it won't flow any further. Um, it's being polluted by detergents, by um, all kinds of things, which is really a shame. And, um, but out of that then um, came a dis little discussion and I think I've said it before, but the reality is we will have salmon that will make it all the way um, up the ravine to our power station in Ophir within one year. And so that's pretty exciting. Now, will they be in Auburn? That's, that's a whole different matter but they'll be down there. That's our property. I checked it out. It's within the city limits. So we will be able to have the on-demand bus bring people down or take people down there and back into our city. And it's going to be really, really exciting. There's a group of people that spend a lot of time counting the, um, counting the salmon that are passing through the different uh, places on the ravine. North Ravine is where they're at now. And they have a very sophisticated um, staff that counts, uh, it does testing. They test for it, the temperature, oxygen, pH, turbidity. And, um, and then they visually have a camera there and they count the salmon. Um, 
so anyway, that's pretty, pretty exciting for all of us and for Auburn. Um, and then finally, uh, to what um, Councilman Berlant said, there will be a meeting, I believe it's next week, um, with the school park preserve and the police chief, and we're going to try and uh, figure out some things because that that is um, been a, a real vocal uh, complaint by a lot of people, and um, hopefully we can we can get a get a handle on that. Um, so, and that's all I have. So we have come to the end of our oh oh our city manager. Yes, um, Ickley. What does that stand for? It just rolls off your tongue. It is the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, ICLE. ICLE, yes. And, and uh, it, it affords us a lot of um, opportunities to collect data and, and makes it easier to help the city. So um, thank you very much for that. And so finally, um, in two weeks, or our next meeting, May 9th, it'll be five o'clock. Um, so this meeting um, is a little bit shorter, but staff's been working so hard. And um, so I'm happy that um, we are all um, able to go home a little bit earlier today, but I'll see everybody at five o'clock the next few weeks. So thank you. And with that, do I have a motion to adjourn or do we just adjourn? I'll adjourn, adjourn. Yeah. Without